Today on the Brain Possible podcast, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Marianne Block, doctor of osteopathy. Dr. Block went to medical school at the age of 39 after her daughter was made ill by psychiatric drugs prescribed for a non-psychiatric condition. Since then, Dr. Block has been a passionate advocate for root cause medicine. She is the author of eight books and has her own private practice in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. She's also the inventor of the Clarity Chair, a tool that she's had success with in treating patients with a whole host of cognitive challenges. Let's get started. Well, first, we are honored to have you join us on the Brain Possible podcast. Let's start with your why. Um, can you tell us um, about your daughter's illness and the psychiatric drugs and how that started this journey for you? Sure. So um, I was a stay-at-home mother and loving every minute of it, uh, but my daughter developed chronic bladder infections. Mm -hmm. And um saw a lot of doctors she was treated with a lot of antibiotics but they were just chronic they you know constantly almost and so we were referred to a urologist and the urologist said oh well we need to treat this differently and he put her on antibiotics for a long term but also put her on valium and tofranil which is an antidepressant and he said, I was like, well, why would you put her on psychiatric medications? And he said, well, because I'm using them for the side effects on her bladder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sounded kind of strange to me, but the last doctor we had seen put her on antibiotics and I had been reading like either Woman's Day or one of those magazines and and it talked about that antibiotic she was on causing neurological problems. So I called the doctor and said, you know, I read where this medication could cause neurological problems. And his response was quit reading. Hmm. Keep in mind, this is in the Mm seventies. We didn't have internet. We didn't have access to any information. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so the new doctor, um, had this, you know, different, different antibiotic, but he wanted to put her on these drugs for six months. And he basically said, look, this is the only way she's going to get well. Well, I'm a young mother. I'm not a doctor. And so I listened and I put her on the drugs. But what happened was um, her, when her pediatrician found out, he didn't like it. And he said, let's get her off those drugs. Call that doctor and tell him, I want her off those drugs. So I called him and he said, well, just stop them. And I'm like, really? Because, I mean, I thought Valium was addictive and it seemed like if she missed a dose, she got really crazy symptoms. He said, no, 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 just stop it. It'll be fine. Oh, that's what I did. And boy, was that a mistake because she went into this whirlwind of illness and she had, um, strep she had mono I mean she was just constantly sick and Mm -hmm. so sick from that withdrawal that abrupt withdrawal that uh, I kept her home uh, one summer 100% and uh, because if she went outside and got exposed to anything she got sick again Mm -hmm. and um, I started seeing other doctors and I got everything from, oh, it's just all in her head um, to, you know, those drugs don't cause that problem. And it was so frustrating that I remember after leaving one doctor's office like that, I just, I had to pull over the side of the road and I just burst out crying because there was just nobody willing to help us. Right. And they were just defending everything that had happened to her by other doctors Mm -hmm. and I thought where do I turn what do I do and that following Sunday I went we went to my parents house every Sunday morning for breakfast and um they took the Dallas paper and so the Dallas paper was laying open and it had this article about this medical detective 
And I thought, well, if I need anything, I need a medical detective. <laughs> and he was an osteopathic physician. I'd never been to a DO before. And there's a lot of bias against DOs, but I thought, this is my daughter. I gotta do whatever it takes right. to help her. And so I made an appointment with this doctor and I, I basically said, look, I'm in charge here. If it's not okay with you, then we'll leave right now. Good. I was just tired of how we've been treated. And he said, sure, that's fine. I, ex- I expect you to be. And I'm like, yeah, board me, you know? Yeah. So he explored this so differently. He tried to find the underlying cause, not only help her get well from the side effects of the drugs, but try to find the real cause of why she was having these bladder infections. Right. And again, I'd never seen this kind of medicine before. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, he helped her get well. And um, I decided that I wanted to become an osteopathic physician because one, I was concerned that if this could happen once, that it could happen again. And I needed to know what doctors knew. And so um, with this doctor's support and encouragement, I went back to school and got my pre-med prerequisites and applied to medical school. And I got into the osteopathic school there that uh, in Fort Worth. And um, it was really, really hard because most people had had all the courses and I had only had the prerequisites. They weren't really very valuable. But uh, every day, literally every day, I am thankful that I did this because not only is my daughter well, Mm -hmm. but within six months of me starting my practice, my mother was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer and Mm -hmm. given two months to live. And I was just devastated, very, very close. And um, I just started looking. I thought, well, they were wrong about my daughter. Maybe they're wrong about my mother. Mm -hmm. And I consulted with integrative doctors, alternative doctors, and began and read and just looked for anything and everything that could help my mother. And uh and applied all of it. And in four months, instead of being dead in two months, in four months, she was in complete total remission where she stayed for 18 more years. And she died at age 92 um, after, you know, very long life and she never had cancer again. And then another situation happened not long after with my dad, Um, he had, this pain in his chest and he went to his cardiologist and the cardiologist, he was 94 at the time. So it was a while later. And the cardiologist said, basically you've lived a good life. You know, there's nothing I can do. And it turned out he had fluid around his heart. And the, the cardiologist said, you know, there's nothing we can do for you. Well, I called an osteopathic cardiologist and told him, he said, you know, Marianne, if, if we do nothing, your dad's going to die. If we do something, he still might die. But what mm-hmm. do we got to lose? Yeah, that's so, that's the kind of answer I like to hear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and very so honest. The took the fluid off of his heart, and he had four more wonderful years of life with no pain, and he died at ninety-eight. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, going to medical school taught me a lot about what doctors know, which is what was my goal, but also taught me what they don't know. Yeah, and you know, we're taught the sciences in the first couple of years of medical school but from the time we're taught about medications and prescriptions it seems like everything else goes away and it's all about that from then on what and, what um don't they learn well they don't learn how to be, how to help people be healthy <laughs> most of the time they don't learn about finding the underlying cause what they mostly learn is how to treat symptoms yeah medication or surgery Mm -hmm. but there's a real lack of knowledge about nutrition but i in an osteopathic school that wasn't the case i was taught we had three courses in nutrition we were taught to look for the underlying cause and i felt like i had this terrific background in medical school that has helped me moving forward to help so many families 
that were in similar situations as I was. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so satisfying, number one, but um, it just, you know, when these, when these families come in and I hear these same stories, whether it may not be bladder infections, it might not be cancer, it might be something else, but it's the same story. Well, my child had this problem, the doctor prescribed this drug. Uh, my mom had this problem, the doctor prescribed this drug but these drugs were not going to fix the problem. And so, you know, I, I have an extensive history for him. I spent an hour with a new patient looking at everything, you know, from childhood on to try to figure out where did this all start and what we, can we do to stop its course and even reverse its course. And um, it's just been very, very satisfying. And I just, you know, I never planned to retire because I, I, I really like what I do and mm -hmm. want to continue to help people. Who um, are your primary clientele? When I first started, I decided I only wanted to work with children. And the main reason was adults were complicated. Adults had all kinds of problems. Layers and layers and layers. Layers and layers, exactly. <laughs> Where children often had just one layer. <laughs> and so, so far. Yeah. Uh, I saw that children that were diagnosed with ADHD often uh, went through the same process as what happened to my daughter. They were prescribed psychiatric drugs mm -hmm. and nobody did any lab tests or sometimes no physical exam even to find out what was causing those symptoms. Right. And so I focused my practice on that um, it initially, uh, mm -hmm. kids with ADHD. And then uh, children with autism began coming to the practice. Wow. And I could see that there's really a continuum, that the same kind of underlying problems that I saw with kids diagnosed with ADHD also had, they got children with, with diagnosed with autism also had similar symptoms or same underlying causes. And for a long time, that's what I did. It was pretty much ADHD and autism. And then the parents started saying, what about me? Yeah. <laughs> Who's gonna help me? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess I had a little more confidence by that time to take on some of those layers mm -hmm. and open my practice to adults. And so now I treat from you know birth on and uh, see all kinds of things from the thyroid problems, uh, so I've, I've written a number of books, uh, two on ADHD, but also wrote a book on called Just Because You're Depressed Doesn't Mean You Have Depression, because mm. I saw that the mothers of the children diagnosed with ADHD were all on antidepressants. And I thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Why, why are they feeling depressed? And I realized there were many, many reasons why they felt depressed. And we started looking at those underlying causes and treating those. And then we were able to very slowly and very carefully get them off the antidepressants, which it has to be that way. A sudden withdrawal from antidepressants is very dangerous. Yeah. And so, um, you know, people read, I wrote the book about my mother's treatment called Today I Will Not Die. And uh, so some people call me, about that treatment. Um, and then um, I wrote a book about treating ear and respiratory infections without drugs. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have an osteopathic, general mm -hmm. osteopathic manipulation that works for that. Mm. And um, so I just, you know, I want to share with people, I don't want them to have to come to the doctor all the time. I want yeah. to have control. I want them to be the ones to, you know, make the right, hopefully right decisions for themselves and do what they can at home. Right. There's a time in the old days <laughs> when I was younger that, you know, people didn't run to the doctor for every little thing. You had a fever. You didn't go to the doctor. You had a fever, you know, yeah. it's fighting the infection. You, you'll get over it. Um, but I found that today parents were bringing their children in for things that in the past they didn't. I think part of it was because both parents were working. They needed to get back to work. They couldn't stay home with their children. But I think um, I wanted to give them that power to make good decisions at home mm -hmm. uh, and, and feel comfortable and safe that mm -hmm. 
you know, to know when they really did need to go to the doctor and when they really didn't, if mm -hmm. I could, could mm -hmm. help with that. So that, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, I remember many times, uh, you know, I would go and take my own son to try different treatments and, you know, sometimes, uh, certain practitioners would even say here, let me try it on you. So you can know what, what he feels. Um, but, but also, you know, as you start to, when taking care of your child, as you start to learn how, what you need to do to have them be healthy and well, we start looking at ourselves and it's like, oh gosh, <laughs> well, I can see I need a lot of work because as you said, um, well, there's many layers to adults and I understand the depression thing as well. Cause I've been, I recently just weaned off of antidepressants. I've been on them for, um, 20 years. Wow. Well, I think what what people don't realize is today <clears throat> doctors are actually being encouraged to um, give patients psychiatric medications because the, I think the reason is because psychiatric is, is subjective. And so they actually save money by not doing tests on the patient by just giving them a, a psychiatric drug. And it's oh, even right. in the middle it's in the medical literature now that first find a psychiatric disorder and give them a medication. No and way. I find that very, very scary. Yeah, it, it is. One of the problems is what you never hear or almost never, I, can't, I guess I shouldn't say never ever, but what you most likely don't hear is, hey, here's the drug that I'm recommending for you there are side effects and risks and let's be on it for a little while. And then you need to make, we need to make a plan on how to get off of it <laughs> because I can say I've been on over the years, I've even been on Adderall and I can tell you, I've moved from city to city to city. You can find any doctor. If you say like, maybe they need the, the slightest bit of proof that the last doctor prescribed it and you did get tested and they did say you need it. They'll give it to you. Right, They'll right. just keep filling that prescription for you. And even teenagers, college kids, you know, they go online and they see the symptoms and then they go to a doctor and say, I, you know, and, and just say those symptoms verbatim. Yeah. <clears throat> and the doctor sometimes without even a physical exam will just write the prescription and, uh, you know, they're highly addictive medications. They're very potentially dangerous. They have a lot of side effects. And I also tell my patients, don't take a medication if you haven't looked at the potential side effects. Mm -hmm. Because the doctor prescribing is going to sleep just fine if you have those side effects. But you may not. And it is always a choice to, as to whether or not you take a medication. And if you don't like the side effects, Maybe you need to find another doctor or somebody that will look, look deeper or find another way to treat it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not anti-drug. I mean, people right. are, they're anti-drug. No, I'm not at all anti-drug. I prescribe medications all the time. But um, if you know somebody has asthma, they need to be prepared for an asthma attack with medication available. But at the same time, I'm going to try to find out the triggers for that asthma. Mm -hmm. So they have less attacks or maybe mm -hmm. no attacks. Mm -hmm. And um, so with like with the ADHD and the autism, to me, they're both neurological problems. Uh, the nervous system is affected and um, finding that underlying cause and it first involves changing your diet. That's the number one most important thing anybody can do. When I and, and that's the key, what you just said, anybody can do. Anybody can do it now, whether they choose to do it, <laughs> else. <clears throat> but it, just for a child with hyperactivity or, or behavior problems, temper, moody, changing their diet in probably 98% of the cases takes care of it. Mm -hmm. And um, food matters and our gut matters. Yeah. Uh, most of our neurotransmitters are made in our gut. Mm -hmm. 
And so same thing with depression, you know, rather than get an SSRI, fix your gut. But also allergies have a, play a major, major role with these symptoms. And- Food um, allergies? Yeah, allergies. Food? Uh, food or inhalants. Uh -huh. <clears throat> My website on blockcenter.com uh, show a video of a little boy going through allergy testing mm -hmm. and the changes in his behavior are so dramatic. And I have done in the past for the COVID, we're not doing it right now, but it's called a provocation neutralization where you inject a small amount of the antigen in um, to provoke a symptom and you watch them. And we, we watch their handwriting. They can start writing backwards or scribbling. They have literally no control over their nervous system. Their behaviors may be off. All kinds of symptoms can occur and physical symptoms too. And then we give a week, <clears throat> weaker, weaker dose to find the exact dose, <clears throat> which is the, sorry, <clears throat> neutralizing dose that makes the symptoms go away. It neutralizes their symptoms and that's their treatment dose. And it's really dramatic. And even young kids <clears throat> will say, what was that? And I'll never eat that again because <clears throat> they don't like the way they're acting on it. And also when they realize it's not them, they're not bad. Yeah. Something happening to them. It changes how they feel about themselves and how everybody that knows them feels about them too. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really remarkable. Um, the changes that that can make. Wow. So we look at diet, allergies, the gut, you know, strap, chronic strap or pandas is also a big issue. Uh, so we look at that, um, mm -hmm. you know, hormones sometimes depending on the age. So there's a lot of <clears throat> medical conditions. Um, so using this biomedical approach, I could help a lot of children. Um, but particularly the children on the autism spectrum, but some diagnosed with ADHD also, still had problems learning. And I would refer them out for different programs like auditory mm -hmm. processing, okay. sensory integration, vision therapy. And, and many would try all those, but what frustrated me was they had to go so many different places and they had to go all over the area and every place they went, it cost them more. <laughs> and I thought to myself, there has to be a way to do this in one place without all that extra expense. And, you know, hopefully simply easily. Um, I began buying a lot of the devices that were being used in some of these programs and exploring, how can I bring them together? How can mm -hmm. I help with the auditory, the visual, the sensory? Um, and, you know, I spent a couple of years trying out these different programs and then working with Hill Laboratories, which is a manufacturer of medical tables and devices. Um, mm -hmm. They came up with a the cha a chair that um, we, com we combined with an auditory and visual program. And we put them all together. So it became this auditory visual and then the, the sensory pieces, which included vestibular, kinesthetic, and, um, and, and we combining them all um, started trying people out on this program to see if it would do anything mm -hmm. and uh, much to my surprise it was changing lives dramatically and uh, you know for example a 16 year old boy who had never spoken anything but gibberish his entire life and the first afternoon after only two sessions there's it's it's two sessions. It's one session twice a day for five days. And um, after that second session on Monday, he began talking. Now he began doing what's called echolalia, which was he was repeating verbatim the movie that he liked to watch over and over again, but he had never spoken. So this was dramatic. 
But even more dramatic is by the end of the week when the program was over, his mom took him to the mall and they had this little merry-go-round kind of thing, you know, at the mall. Mm -hmm. And she said, normally he would have just walked up and tried to get on one of the horses and, you know, without any concept that you had to pay or, you know, ask permission. But he walked up to the person, the ticket person and said, how much does it cost to ride this ride? I mean, that wow. was the first, I very mature. Show, that was the first sentence he ever said. <laughs> and, you know, after they picked his mother up off the floor, <laughs> she explained that, you know, he had never spoken before like this, a, you know, legitimate, full, appropriate sentences. And so they let him ride the ride for free. Aww. And, you know, he just continued to speak more and more. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So for a little context, mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about the clarity chair, the clarity chair. Yes. And when did you start, when did you, um, put together this invention of the clarity well, chair? Well, it's probably been about 10 years at this point from the time I started. And initially I thought it might take a month, even two months for someone to be on the chair and have results. Uh, but what happened I, was people would say, well, I can't be away from school or I can't be away mm -hmm. from work that long. Mm -hmm. Can we do it shorter? So instead of once a day for a month, we started doing it twice a day for two weeks. And then people said, well, what about a shorter amount of time? So we just <laughs> shortening it. And at five days, we were getting better results than we were getting at two weeks or three weeks. And then when somebody said, how about shorter? How about three days? I said, well, we can try it. But what happened was it, it didn't work as well. And five mm -hmm. days ended up being the sweet spot that people got better. And it was fast enough because it was only five days. And um, so that's kind of where we stayed was the five days. And so on the chair, the chair moves in a figure eight and it, it goes up and down but it goes around and, and that provides that tactile and the uh, vestibular uh, motion mm -hmm. to get because the ear um, is affected by this up and down and, and rotation mm -hmm. and then uh, they look at a screen that has some lights some colored lights on it and they listen to some music um, and you know, just begin seeing some remarkable things that a, a child had never spoken, maybe didn't start speaking the full sentences the way the 16 year old had, but they were much younger. And we'd have um, speech therapists call and say, you know, I've been working with this child for two years and he never said a word. Mm -hmm. And then he did your clarity chair and now he's talking and I can now work with him. And so I kind of feel like it resets things. I, I kind of use the example of a, a house that's on an uneven foundation. If you keep building on that house, you know, it's going to fall over. <laughs> but if you reset that foundation and make it even, then you can build and build and build. And so uh, s some of these programs are still great to use after clarity chair, like speech therapy and other programs, because it's I, they're able to be more productive with those programs after everything has been kind of reset. Hmm. And that's my interpretation of what's happening from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. What are the different, you said there was different devices that you were trying out and had you think, let me put these together. Can you yeah. share what those different devices are? Well, one was an auditory, a couple, few of more auditory programs, uh, devices that um, um, were used, and I wish I could think of the name off the top of my head, but I can't, um, that uh, there are a lot of auditory programs that people are using just isolated, just to do auditory processing. And I think that's great if that's your only problem is auditory processing. Right. Um, and but if you, you know, the brain doesn't learn with an isolated sense. We don't learn to ride a bicycle with our eyes closed and our ears mm. shut off. We use right. all of our senses. And that's 
that's how the brain works. And I think one of, one of the issues like vision therapy, which I think is great, um, but it, if it's only working with the vision, then what about the, everything else? Hmm. And I think the reason that my program works so fast is because we are including all the you know, senses. Now we're not using taste or smell. And the reason for that is um, the sensitivities. People mm-hmm. have sensitivities to smell, t- taste and smell. And so um, we don't want to make them sick right. with this program. As you're moving them all over the place. And we're moving them all over. We don't want them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, and it's worked without it, without doing that. So um, hmm. uh, I think that, you know, it was just kind of, you could call it luck. I don't know that I was able to figure this out. And, and um, when, once I started seeing the changes, uh, I just, just kept going with it. And mm-hmm. when, um, with autism, the kids with autism, and I can't, I can't use those terms in with clarity chair, you know, I can't say that it helps with any specific diagnosis because you have to have FDA approval for each diagnosis in order to do that. But I can say that, you know, children have started, started speaking, they've stopped flapping, they start make eye contact, things that are typical symptoms of autism. And same thing with ADHD symptoms. I don't, I don't even like those diagnoses because it doesn't address the underlying cause. Uh, but children who have been labeled ADHD, mm-hmm. Well, we will see them being able to listen, to sit still and focus and concentrate and um, behave better. Mm-hmm. All those things are occurring. And after a while, when I saw such great results, I thought, I wonder if this would work with someone with dementia. And I didn't have any patients in my practice with dementia, but a friend of mine did, and he told them about it. And so this man comes over to do the program and I mean in five days he had his memory back which just blew us all away oh my goodness yeah (laughs) and um I'm not saying that this is this will happen to everyone I I can't say that at all but it was it was so incredible that his neurologist took him off all his medications and you know And and go ahead do you, I'm sure this doesn't, these, you don't see results with everyone. We usually see some benefit with everyone. I'm, you know, it's hard to think of anyone who didn't see some benefit. Okay. But the extent of the benefit definitely varies dramatically. Mm-hmm. So just like the 16 year old who spoke in complete complex sentences, then another child might just say hi. Mm-hmm. or bye. Um, so it does vary and because everybody's an individual. And I also like to do the biomedical as much as possible because I feel like if the nervous system is reacting because of your diet, because of your allergies, because of any reason, it's going to be much harder to kind of retrain the brain and lay down those new pathways that we're trying to do in five days if you're battling these other reactions. So I think the more we calm those things down, the mm-hmm. better results we see as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause you can learn, you can learn better. Yeah. <laughs> if you can calm those down, just like children with epilepsy, if they're constantly having seizures, it's hard for right. them to move forward. Exactly. And yeah. sometimes they may show a lot of other symptoms like not being very physically active or they're learning, they might slip back a few grades because they're having seizures all the time. So they can never move forward. Exactly. Kind of, you know, two steps forward, one back, or sometimes two forward and two back. Mm. Um, We had the opportunity to uh, do a small study at a um, school with uh, traumatic brain injury. Oh, and 
um, again, in five days, the results were very dramatic and they rechecked them 30 days later. And, and these were people who had long-term brain injury. Right. They very are, different. Pretty much tried everything, you know. Yeah. Um, 62% of symptoms completely resolved. And 82% got better. And where was this study done? It was done in Atlanta at Life University. Oh, wow. And they published it. It was an independent study, not involving us. Mm -hmm. so they did publish it. Um, so what we're seeing is almost any neurological situation seems to get better. Um, you know, you mentioned seizures, and that has not been something that we focused on. Uh, one young lady, parents did not tell me she had had seizures. Mm -hmm. And because I probably wouldn't have done it because I don't want to make somebody worse. And I didn't well, know all those lights. Yeah, I didn't know if it would. You know, they're not like this kind of light. It's very slow in and out, but still. Um, and she had no seizures. They, they told me afterwards, oh, she has, she has seizures. <laughs> like, why did you tell me that before? Um, but they said she had no seizures that entire time. Um, so I think the, the possibilities, I like to think, are endless. And um, hopefully you know, more and more people will learn about it. There are clarity chairs th throughout the United States. And there's also a lot of them in the Middle East. Uh, over there, they really didn't have much for autism. And so they're mostly interested in it for autism in the Middle mm -hmm. East. And then they discovered that the kids diagnosed with ADHD also were doing very well. And so they focus just on the children over there, but there's a, a, a starting to be a huge demand for it. So tell me more about your chair. Do you only have it there in Texas? No, actually, that's what I'm saying. They, they, there, they, are, they there, are, there are three in distribute. Texas. If, if someone wanted to know where it was, they can go to claritychair.com and look at locations. Which practitioners have it? Yeah. There are three in Texas. There's one in Louisiana, one in Florida, um, one in Michigan, one in Northern California. Um, that was four in, four in Texas, I guess. Mm. Anyway, um, there's, they're around. I don't think there's enough of them around yet to help people, but when it's just five days, I think people can go to those locations for just mm -hmm. five days, you know, it's mm -hmm. not long term. And then there's a lot of them, like I said, in, in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Dubai, and how long do they sit on the chair? It's an hour twice a day for five days. Mm -hmm. And so they do it an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. And they come back the next day. I think one of the most dramatic cases was uh, Kira, who came to me because she had completely lost her memory. 100%. She didn't know who she was. She didn't know who her parents were. She didn't know why she was living in this house with these strangers. And she didn't even know where the bathroom was in her house. And I mean, she was screaming all the time because she was scared to death. Well, she had been, again, given two medications and they were not indicated for a child. They were neurological medications. And the mother noticed that this happened after she took those medications. They were prescribed for a stomach problem. And the doctor decided this was a neurological stomach problem. So he prescribed the drugs. So mom called the doctor back and told him what had happened. And he said, well, there's no way that those, that's from the drugs. It took her months before someone told her about me. And she came to say, see me. And I just looked up the, the two drugs. Both of them listed amnesia as a side effect. Oh, my goodness. When, how long ago was this? That was probably maybe four or five years ago. Hmm. Um, probably maybe five or six. And um, honestly, I didn't know if I could help her or how to help her, but I thought, well, clarity chair won't help. I mean, won't hurt. It might help, but it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. won't hurt you. Let's try it. Right. So on Wednesday afternoon, she had this severe reaction. I mean, she just, you know, really went off and, 
And I thought, oh my gosh, I've made this poor child worse. I don't know what to do. Maybe she seemed to be better Monday and Tuesday. Maybe I'll put her back on the Monday, Tuesday, you know, colors and, and music and at least calm her down and then we'll just stop it. And um, she came to the office Thursday morning and she walks in and she's got this huge smile on her face, which nobody had seen for months. And she had her complete memory back. My goodness. So how, how do people find out about you? <laughs> I, I know that they could go to your website, but generally how, how well, are people uh, finding out about this? word of mouth and through my books i'm i've not literally never advertised mm-hmm. clarity care mm-hmm. and met to much extent right um i'm probably you know it'd be probably a good idea to do so but um i'm i'm actually um i'm older <laughs> and um I'm hoping that someone will come along and want to purchase my company who believes in it and knows how to take this, this device, this chair and get it to the world. Hmm. Cause I don't know how to do that. Right. Cause you're not, I'm a doctor. A, you're not a businesswoman. Right. I mean, you are cause you have a business, but yeah, but I, I don't that. want to give up my practice and I, but I, you know, want people to know about this. And, um, you know, maybe if I was 10, 20 years younger, that would be different, but I'm not. <laughs> and so I, I'm hoping that will happen. I don't know where to find those people, <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, I think it would be really nice uh, for someone to, to be able to do that and really literally get it to the world. Hmm. And um, it, there's so many symptoms by the way we ended up treating someone with depression one of my patients he he um he had severe depression and i said look why don't you try this if it doesn't work you know no charge just try it Mm -hmm. and he did and he said oh my gosh he said i smile all the time now i sing my my friends can't even believe it's me He, he couldn't believe the changes in himself and we've had seen the same thing with anxiety. We've seen it with Parkinson's symptoms. Um, I just, I want so badly to, for this to be known and for people to benefit from it mm-hmm. around the world. You know, I really want that to be uh, truly my legacy that, that, that this could help so many people. Have you ever read the book, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself? No. No, I haven't. Oh, you would probably like it. It was the first when my son was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. It was the first book that um, we went out to California and went to the Anat Benyel Method Center. Mm -hmm. And we asked one of the practitioners there, you know, we wanted to learn. And we said, what is the, where should we start? And he suggested that we read that book. And we've read it and listened to it. And I know that there's some, there's in a chapter in there that I haven't read it in so long, but uh, to talking about uh, the vestibular. Mm -hmm. So there was this one woman who couldn't be helped and, and there was something that they did. I would have to go back, but you'll have to listen to that book or read it. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll make note of that. Yeah. So I guess I want to hear more about you believe your beliefs on, you know, what's possible for people. You know, when someone has been given a diagnosis, I like how you say that you don't know if your chair can help, but you do know it can't hurt. Yeah, and you know, people do ask, are there any side effects? And there have been maybe a handful okay. that had, you can say, worsening of their symptoms. Mm. But every single one improved those symptoms by 30 days after the program. Mm. So one child began stimming much, much more than he had been. Right. 
and but it's thir about 30 days and I don't know why that 30 days is so magical but he just stops dimming altogether what what are the other uh tools you use in your practice other than the chair because yeah. you sound like your audience or your clientele is very much like our audience mm -hmm. so I'm interested because um Sounds well, like you... I, I look at that history form, which is about 18 pages long, because wow. I'm looking for history um, for a child. I want to know even before that child was born, the health of the parents. And for an adult, I want to go back to their childhood as much as possible. And I look at the diet. I look at, I, they, they do a week's diet diary. And, and then, um, we do do a lot of lab tests because I want to see what's really, you know, what we can document that's going on. And uh, like I mentioned, the allergy is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The gut, we do a comprehensive stool analysis. It's not your usual stool test that you get from your regular labs. It's a specialty lab that literally knows what they're looking for. And which they, which so, lab is that? Uh, doctor's data. Okay. They look for literally thousands of bad bacteria. They look for good bacteria. They look for parasites. Mm -hmm. They looked at the immune system of the gut. Are you breaking down your foods in order mm -hmm. to digest them? Mm -hmm. Do you have inflammation in your gut? I mean, so many important things because, you know, what we've learned is the gut is the second brain. Mm. And it makes uh, like 95% of serotonin is made in the brain, in the gut. And most of the neurotransmitters are made in the gut. And so if the gut's not working, the brain isn't working. Mm -hmm. So all that's the nervous system isn't working. So that's a real important test. Um, I look at hormones in women, uh, if they're, you know, it, of, a, of an age and I look for um, menopause and uh, other symptoms. What I found really interesting with women who are taking antidepressants, so I'll say, well, when did you first feel depressed? When did they start putting you on medications? And say, oh, I think it was about 14 or 15. And I'll say, well, when did you start your menstrual cycle? Oh, about 14 or 15. <laughs> <laughs> you know how long I've been on those antidepressants? I think I was 15 yeah, when I went on them. Those are so important. And when we talk about things like postpartum depression, uh, uh, <laughs> It irons me because it's not postpartum depression. It's postpartum hormone imbalance. Mm. And the solution is not an antidepressant. The solution is balancing the hormones. And I had one woman tell me, well, my well, doctor told me that, that we needed, that, that, that mm -hmm. the problem was my hormones were imbalanced, but it was too hard to balance them. So she was just going to give me an antidepressant. Well, those are really helpful when you're down in the dumps and I don't want to um, discount them when you are feeling I've been extremely depressed and had loss and, you know, all the things. So I, I do want people to know, like, if they're sitting here listening, thinking, well, gosh, I'm on an antidepressant. Um, well, I want to make sure nobody stops. One. No, don't ever stop them just without someone who can help you. It took me many, many years to actually wean off of them. And I had um, several different, I've worked with different types of doctors, a naturopathic doctor who helped me with the hormones. Mm -hmm. And then another doctor who helped, you know, continue cleaning things up. She was a medical doctor, but also a functional medicine doctor. And continuing, you know, testing all these different things. It was most recently, and I made improvement and was able to lower the dose, but not ever able to get off. Mm -hmm. Recently, uh, I did a hair and mineral analysis. Have, do you do those? I don't. Um, we, we do know that most people in the United States are, are low in these things. because yeah. I can look at their diet and tell them pretty much if they got an unhealthy gut and a bad diet, they're going to be low in vitamins and minerals. Well, I had a pretty good diet as far as compared to standard Americans. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my my um, health coach told me, so this is the first time, you know, the other two were doctors <laughs> that have been, had been helping me. This one, mm -hmm. she's a health coach and she, 
you know, mentioned how much mineral, I believe it's hormones, as you're saying, but the reason I'm bringing this up is also minerals because you become more depleted in your minerals uh, after having babies. And I've had five. <laughs> and stress also, you know, ma magnesium is something that I focus on in my practice. I hadn't mentioned yet. I actually give magnesium injections because that's the best way to get magnesium into the body. You can't predict how much it's going to get absorbed from the gut. And again, that's just been so dramatic. I, I, even kids will come in and can I have another shot? <laughs> because they feel so good. Wow. And magnesium has been shown to help almost every psychiatric or neurological disorder. And among other things, I mean, so anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. lowers blood pressure, uh, helps muscle aches and pains, menstrual mm -hmm. uh, decreases risk of heart attack, mm -hmm. uh, just it helps focus and concentration. And I've always said that if the government came along and said, okay, you can only pick one treatment for your practice and you can do nothing else, I would choose injectable magnesium. Mm. Well, I, yeah, that's one that everyone at one point or another, every practitioner I've hired has recommended, not always to have every day, but also you can, even with my little guy, I used to have him taking Epsom salt baths. Mm -hmm. That's my Because that's how they wanted him, you know, is easily absorbed by him. And he should, for, for several different reasons, there were different things we put in the bathtub, but mm -hmm. magnesium was for, was one of them important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, think I recommend that all the time. Helps yeah. you with detoxifying too, to keep your stools regular. Right. And right. yes. Yeah. Think about it. If you're constipated, all those toxins that are trying to get out, just are going to get reabsorbed. Mm. And um, I do a lot of thyroid work also, which also is associated with feeling depressed. And, you know, probably 98% of doctors do a thyroid lab test and they say you are low or you're not low in thyroid. But it turns out there's over 200 studies in the medical literature that say those lab tests are not at all um, in, in, indicative of what your thyroid is doing. It's actually not measuring what doctors think it's measuring. And before we had lab tests, and those thyroid lab tests came around in the late 1960s, doctors used symptoms to determine whether you needed to be treated or and actually how much to treat with. And I was watching an old movie and um, medical, I like to watch old medical stuff. Me, me too, <laughs> historical. <laughs> And it's exactly what they were doing. It was probably late 1800s, early 1900s. And they were treating, you know, she said, oh, by looking at this patient, you know, we know you have a thyroid problem. Well, that once thyroid labs came along, that just sort of went, went away. And in medical school, my osteopathic medical school, I was taught treat the patient, not a lab value. Hmm. And I think nowhere is that more important than with thyroid because I see people come in all the time I mean, they have, you know, 35 symptoms of, of low thyroid, but their lab test was normal. Mm -hmm. And so nobody was willing to treat them. And I'd much rather give a trial of thyroid medication to someone who feels sad or depressed, or, you know, particularly if they have a number of other symptoms of, mm -hmm. of hypothyroidism. And, and they'll often tell me, I, I've just never felt better. Um, it's changed my life. Hmm. Wow. And I wish more doctors knew about that. <laughs> so how I have to ask this, a lot of treatments are very expensive. Um, how pricey is it to try out this chair other than someone, if they may have to travel and, and the cost of being out of work, taking their kid to do this twice a day for five days? Yeah. What kind of well, every clinic can charge whatever they want. Right, right. Um, Generally. It's not a franchise. So what I, you've I, seen. Everything from 1500 to 2500 For Which, the whole. A week. For the whole, whole week. week. And I think, you know, when I look at other programs, mm -hmm. um, it, it not only seemed competitive, but it seemed a lot less. It depends on what it is. Yeah. 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 It sounds in the ballpark, but yeah, it's a big chunk of money for 
It is. A lot of people, many mm. people save up a long time just to go for a week of treatment somewhere. I, myself included. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I recognize that. And that was one of the reasons my motivations for developing it is because if they were going to do auditory processing, sensor integration, vision therapy, all those things, it was going to cost far more because each one was going to cost mm -hmm. possibly that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share about your experiences and the chair. Um, Dr. Block, is there anything else that you would like to share with the Brain Possible community today to be complete? Well, I would like to tell them my two websites, which one is blockcenter.com and the other is claritychair.com. And I just, I want people to know that the power is in their hands and they, the, the doctors work for us. And if something doesn't seem right, it's probably not right. And be sure and look up drug side effects before you take one. And if you don't like the side effects, see if there's another treatment. And I just always like to treat people as naturally as possible with mm -hmm. as few of medications or short-term medications as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And remember that what you eat is the most important thing with how you feel. I agree. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time and I know that your time is valuable. And thank you for spending it here with me today. I appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Dr. Block? Do you have your own story that you would like to share with us? We would love to hear from you. Let us know how we can be useful in your journey. Email us at info at the .com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. It would mean the world to us. And you may also consider visiting our website, thebrainpossible.com, for more information on stories, different therapies, and products that we think that you will love and may support you on your healing journey. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible. See you next week and be well.